And thank you for joining us for the UN 75 Global Governance Forum. Over the next two days, we will harness our collective wisdom towards building the roadmap for the future we want, the UN we need. We will explore the possibility and potential of partnerships and innovations to support the four pillars of the United Nations. We will present ideas and proposals to advance progress towards the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Our work aspires to raise the ambition of the UN 75 Declaration with global action to deliver the future we want. 20 diverse partnership initiatives representing over 260 participants will advance commitments to action through multi-stakeholder collaboration. Many complex challenges will be addressed, including building a network for peace in Colombia. Food security in Somalia will advance through a partnership on cold chain development for the fishing industry. Multiple partnerships will focus on the urgent need for connectivity and cooperation throughout the world in the wake of COVID-19. As we enter into a new era of technology and equity, we look at issues for post-conflict restoration and financial equity. The Forum's Innovation Track convened 260 experts worldwide to build upon two years of dialogues and reports to advance 20 institutional, policy, and normative change proposals to enhance global governance. Special attention was given in the innovation track to elaborating upon the UN 75 political declaration's individual commitments, as well as specific tactics for building diverse coalitions and mobilizing political support worldwide for the 20 identified global governance recommendations. Through our combined efforts, we bring inspiration and ideas for a new path forward for people and planet. We thank you for joining us as we gather to honor the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and move forward with hope and optimism for the future we want, the UN we need. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the UN 75 Global Governance Forum. I am Mariam Namazi and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today and tomorrow's opening plenary sessions. Um, it's great that uh, the audience that we have with us today is, is really a wonderful reflection of, uh, of the spirit of this forum. I know that there are thousands of you that are joining us from countries all over the world. So thank you very much for joining us today and a very warm welcome to you all. Um, and I mean, what a time it is for us to be getting together to mark this anniversary. Uh, certainly from, from my perspective in the newsroom, we cover stories every day, a, a multitude of, of conflicts and crises that are are quite difficult to keep pace with uh, and seemingly impossible to resolve. We have stories about uh, fences and, and border walls being put up, uh, claiming protection from some sort of outside enemy, that often at the expense of human rights and democratic freedom. Yes, the context might have changed, but still uh, some echoes there of a, a very dangerous past as well. Um, and then in countries all over the world, we are seeing this a stranglehold on civil society, that is tightening. And I, I feel humbled and inspired when we report on the people that do have the courage to speak out against governments that have failed to uphold their obligations, uh, governments that are uh, denying people their rights and in many cases violating them. And the people who do this often do so at great personal risk to themselves. And, and you know, it's difficult when you reflect on all of this not to feel an overwhelming sense of powerlessness, uh, but that in itself, I think, is a sign of our privilege. Uh, and we need to recognize that and appreciate that because each and every one of us can make a difference. We can make a contribution, uh, even if it's just to speak out in some small way in favor of governance with fairness and justice to all. Um, I can't imagine what would happen now if, if countries came together to try and do what they did 75 years ago. Uh, quite simply, I don't think it could happen in the, the nativist 
uh, confrontational uh, political environment that we have, but I think that really reinforces the significance of our multilateral institutions, as strained and flawed, as imperfect as they might be, we are very fortunate to have them and they do provide a space, albeit a, a virtual one, uh, like we're doing today for us to come together and uphold those shared values and principles, uh, regardless of uh, race, origin, language or culture. Uh, so thank you once again for joining us. It's going to be an interesting couple of days. Uh, hopefully what is just the beginning of a new momentum for action. And um, with that, I'm pleased to now introduce uh, UN75 Global Governance Forum Project Director, Maureen Connolly. Thank you, Miriam. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, greetings. I am Maureen Connolly and it is my honor and pleasure as the Forum Director to welcome all of you to our virtual convening, the UN75 Global Governance Forum. The world has certainly changed since we began planning this event last December. First scheduled around Charter Day in June in San Francisco, and then for this week in New York at UN headquarters. But, UN, uh, but COVID-19 has brought us to a new reality for working, convening, and collaborating. So I am grateful for the more than 3,000 participants who have registered for this week's forum with diverse backgrounds as scholars, practitioners, activists, philanthropists, business leaders, and policymakers gathered virtually to honor the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, a cornerstone of international order since 1945. As with all of us, the United Nations must continue to adapt and innovate to respond to new threats, challenges, and opportunities in our current age of complexity. Through the UN75 Global Governance Forum, along two distinct partnership and innovation tracks, we seek to promote a more inclusive and effective United Nations, emphasizing dialogue, creative initiatives, and new proposals on the future of global governance. This is not a one-time event, but rather the UN anniversary has been a catalyst to build a community that is aligned and oriented in support of wider ongoing efforts to strengthen global cooperation, such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement, and perhaps most timely, the UN 75 Declaration to be endorsed next week by world leaders at the start of the General Assembly's 75th session. We will continue building on the innovation and partnership initiatives presented during this forum, and we'll update you on our progress as we strive to bring new stakeholders into an ever-expanding community. We are mobilized for action and proud <clears throat> to be bringing you a group of presenters over the next three days who have the momentum and drive to overcome the pandemic and other global challenges while honoring the founding principles of the United Nations Charter and moving forward into a new era of connectivity and cooperation. A very special thank you to our planning partners, the Stimson Center, Global Challenges Foundation, One Earth Future Foundation, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, and the Global Governance Philanthropy Network. And finally, last but far from least, thank you to the hundreds of talented individuals who collaborated closely over the past 10 months to prepare for this forum and to introduce to you today a new roadmap to the future we want, the United Nations we need. Thank you. Maureen, thank you very much for that. And uh, I just wanna follow on now from uh, from Maureen's remarks, because it's, it's actually worth mentioning that uh, this forum is really just a glimpse of the work that's been undertaken by uh, various partner organizations in recent years through research, through civil society coalition building and advocacy. And of course, the, the objective here was to try and capture a unifying vision and for it really to be a, a very practical thing, uh, a call to action uh, for, for obviously the people that we have today, the leaders, and the younger generation of today and future generations. So uh, with that in mind, we'll now have a brief presentation of the forum's final document. Uh, the title is Roadmap for the Future, 
uh, roadmap for the future we want, I should say, and the United Nations we need. This is going to be led by Christina Pektu. Uh, she is a young leader from Romania and research associate at the Stimson Center. And then we'll get a response to this from Professor Tijani Mohamed Bande, President of the 74th Session of the General Assembly and Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations. Uh, so that's where we're headed next. Christina, first, over to you. Thank you, Mariam, and thanks to all of you for joining us from all across the world. Back in uh, January of this year, I was asked by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres at the kickoff of his UN 75 Global Conversation if I believed that people in 2045 will be better off or worse off than today. I told him that we should see 2020 and UN 75 as if we were at crossroads and we can choose which path we want to follow. That in the wake of crisis, societies can either break down or break through. And so in order to be better off in 2045, societies will need to break through. In this spirit, we scholars, practitioners, activists, philanthropists, business leaders and policymakers embarked on a journey to promote the United Nations that better harnesses the ideas, networks and capabilities of diverse governments, businesses and civil society groups. The forum's outcome document, the roadmap for the future we want and the UN we need, a vision 2020 for UN 75 and beyond, seeks to promote a more inclusive and effective United Nations, emphasizing dialogue, creative initiatives, and forward-looking proposals on the future of global governance. It helps raise the UN 75 Declaration's ambition in two notable ways. First, by initiating new partnerships between civic actors, the private sector, and the United Nations to mobilize and share knowledge technologies and financial resources to promote a truly people-centered architecture for global collective action. And second, by suggesting carefully researched and debated institutional policy and normative change ideas to revitalize and strengthen global governance. This roadmap for the future we want in the UN we need places human rights, human solidarity, and the need for a strong global civic ethic at the heart of an inclusive conception of governance across borders. It takes an unapologetic stand against the rise of exclusive nationalism, which corrodes efforts to upgrade our three quarters of a century structure of international order. Its recommendations and spirit of initiative reinforce key ideas and sentiments voiced by citizens worldwide participating in the Secretary General's remarkable global conversation. The COVID-19 pandemic and the UN 75th anniversary may be both only momentary in world history, but if member states and global civil society truly strive hard to build back better, they could also represent major turning points given their opportunity for the United Nations to accelerate action towards a brighter future for all. By rising up in support of the UN 75 Declaration and working in partnership to realize its full potential, we aim to ensure that the future we want for, the bo for both present and future generations becomes the future we get. And by deepening the bonds of global solidarity and cooperation, the present breakthrough in global governance can indeed be turned into a breakthrough. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us today and receiving the roadmap as a symbol of appreciation for the legacy of your work as president of the 74th session of the General Assembly and for your continued leadership and inspiration as we move forward beyond UN 75. Thank you. Christina, thanks so much. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's an ambitious vision that's been laid out in this roadmap, but it needs to be, doesn't it, because of the scale of the challenges uh, facing the world right now. It's not something, uh, it, it's simply too big for any one country or regional institution to tackle on its own. And it, the thing that comes through from, from uh, this, this roadmap is that it's really the, the creation and the scaling up of these multi-stakeholder partnerships that will be the challenge for collective action. And I think it's really important here to, to get the, the thoughts of Professor Bande. Professor Bande, I know that you're, um, you're standing by. Uh, and 
you know, given that the negotiations of the UN 75 declaration took place under your presidency of the General Assembly, uh, time and again, you know, we've seen uh, that the focus and the, the consensus just isn't there for, for coordinated action on global issues. How then can this roadmap be a, a launching pad for action and change? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and to really congratulate the forum for this very important initiative, especially during this pandemic. The roadmap which I have received is extremely important and it speaks to also what we had also as a political declaration. I'm grateful to participate in this and I commend organizers that they are able to do this. The world took a third step by establishing the United Nations 75 years ago to among other things save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. The organization provided an avenue for state parties to iron out their differences and ensure that events like the, like the Second World never occurred again. The leaders chose not to be cynical and, and engage to transform a divided world into a united one. This organization has therefore an honorable legitimacy and reach, privileging international law and order and rules-based positions. Now, 75 years since its existence, it had continued to work around its main pillars of peace and security, development and human rights. It has done this especially to guarantee that peace and security are brought about by fight against poverty and inequality, climate change, and ensuring respect for the rights of all people. The Paris Agreement of 2015 and the 2030 Agenda are really key points of reference in this regard. In addition to providing peacekeepers in conflict areas, the United Nations have been greatly involved in advocating for effective early detection and warning systems in conflict-prone areas, as well as mediation, negotiation, and peaceful settlement of disputes. It facilitated partnership for the implementation of SDGs with member states utilizing its platform for sharing knowledge on sustainable food production systems, resilient agriculture systems, financial for development, and so on. It is painfully true that the organization has on occasion fallen short the long drawn conflict in the Middle East, especially on around Palestinian statehood and the response uh, to the Rwandan genocide as it unfolded are uh, some of those we are not happy about. Nonetheless, the organization is aligning one. It, un it has continued to work harder at correcting such mistakes. 75 years is an occasion for the United Nations to rededicate and restructure around how it works, does its work. This is what the declaration on the commemoration of 75th anniversary seeks to achieve. To achieve the future we want, we have to redouble our efforts to ensure that no one is left behind and to ensure that the disruption caused by the major pandemic propels us even further to guarantee delivery on the promise of SDGs attainment on time, 2030. Surely, we are duty bound to ensure that all threats to peace and security are resolved through peaceful means. The protection of our planet by acting now to curb greenhouse gas emissions, ensuring that women and girls and youth are equally important partners in all we do, and that international law and rules based order are respected. Doing this requires not only sustainable financing, but also multi stakeholder support and partnerships of government, NGOs, and civil society. As we celebrate excellencies, distinguished participants, the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the United Nations, we must renew our commitment to its ideals and values and devise creative ways of delivering for, most of the, for the most vulnerable in society. This is the aspiration of our founding fathers and we have the backing of the charter in the discharge of this duty. The truly global stirrings of a movement for social and environmental justice currently deepening gives me hope that we will, will be working will be worthy hears of the founders of our organization. I thank you all for listening to me and look forward to join you again during the panel discussions. 
That's great. Thank you very much, Professor Bande. And um, yeah, we, of course, uh, Professor Bande will be joining us for the opening plenary session. So we're going to hear plenty more from him. Uh, but before we get into that, we have a question from the audience. I believe we have Dayasaku Higashi from Sophia University in Japan. You can ask your question to Professor Bande. Uh, thank you very much for having me to ask these questions. And my name is Daisaku Higashi. I'm a professor at Sofia University in Tokyo. And the, I've been doing, conducting my field research uh, on South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and uh, Afghanistan, focusing on the question of the inclusivities. And I was requested by Japanese foreign minister to go South Sudan and Iran, no, Iraq last year to deliver my lectures and also conduct research on that regard. So my question is that, I recognize that Professor Bande did quite a big effort to make very inclusive process of adapting this UN 75 declarations, inviting many civil organizations, civil societies, NGO, think tank, religious organizations, and the scholars. So my question is, what was the challenge of making that kind of inclusive process? And how do you see the tangible result or impact on making that process. Thank you very much. Well, there are many things we could talk about this, but uh, the moderator was very clear. We should talk uh, only for two, three minutes and I will, I will be brief. I think even the language of the document was really crafted to ensure people can really relate to it. The long windedness we are known for, I think gave way to clear up clearer statements as to where we are going. And the involvement of civil society in particular deepened our sense of urgency relating to local issues. This, this was important in relation to leaving no one behind. What are the issues that were urgent as seen from the grassroots? I think this is really important relating to uh, questions of inclusion of women, youth, the disabled in relation to the follow-up, you could see there was the push to say, okay, what happens after a declaration? The last element was to say the Secretary General should give recommendations that will get us to, to follow on what we have stated. This is important. When you, when you first of all work on the issue of trust element with what involvement civil society also brought to us that let us rebuild trust. Without trust, the organization cannot work. And this is very well understood. That's why it's one of the elements there, including the idea, how do we have recommendations? The Secretary General is now mandated to, to do the work required to say all these commitments to all in all, let us make sure that this was done. So the inclusivity of the process uh, involving not only government, but in particular, civil society organizations helped us greatly. And I'm glad you, you noted the, the way we conducted the process. It was a difficult one because it was a divided house on occasion, but we continue to remind that if the organization is to continue to be relevant, this is the moment it must come together. There were certain times when two words held us up for almost 10 days, but we, we, we overcame because people became responsive to the moment. COVID was a reminder of all of the connections among us and that any, any nation that is in crisis affects us all and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. So thank you uh, to Professor Bande for uh, your response to the question there and also to Christina for the presentation laying everything out. So clearly it sets us up very nicely for the opening plenary session, which. Uh, really goes to the heart of the forum, looking now at the future of the United Nations, how it needs to, to change and adapt and, and build on, on its accomplishments as well. We have four of the forum's honorary co-chairs with us now. Um, of course, in a few days time, we're going to see the, the endorsement of the new UN 75 declaration by world leaders. Uh, that contains 12 distinct commitments and points for global action. So this is a very actionable initiative. That's what we want to emphasize. Um, and here we want to focus on how new tools, platforms and approaches to global governance can address the threats and the challenges facing the world. 
Uh, so what we're going to do now is have a couple of rounds of questions with our panelists who are standing by. That will be followed by some Q&A with you guys. So let's uh, let's introduce the panelists. We have His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the 8th UN Secretary General, uh, Deputy Chair of the Elders and President and Chair of the Global Green Growth Institute. Uh, Aya Chebi, Miss Aya Chebi with us, African Union Envoy on Youth. Um, still with us, of course, Professor Tajani Mohamed Bande, outgoing President of uh, the General Assembly, as we said, and Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations. And I'd like to also bring in Dr. Gro Harlem Brundtland, co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, member of the Elders as well, former Director General of the World Health Organization and Prime Minister of Norway. So thank you everyone for joining us for this. Um, I'm going to kick things off with, uh, with Ban Ki-moon. Uh, now, I need to tell you that he wasn't able to join us in real time. Uh, but was good enough to share his reflections on the roadmap for the future. And he, he shares with us now his view on the UN's historic accomplishments, uh, but also one area where the world body failed to live up to its, uh, failed to live up to its um, aspirations. Multilateralism and respect for a global rules-based system has underpinned peace, security, health and prosperity across a large swath of the world for the past 75 years. The United Nations embodies these principles and remains an indispensable actor in facing contemporary ex existential threats from pandemics to climate change and nuclear non-proliferation. The UN has played a particularly invaluable role in the tackling of infectious disease of the past 75 years. Without the vaccination programs coordinated through the World Health Organization, we would not have achieved the eradication of smallpox and the near eradication of polio, two diseases which used to cause widespread death and disability. Similarly, the significant progress that has been made in the fight against HIV AIDS was enabled through global coordination uh, through the UN system. These gains were not an inevitable part of human development, but were made possible in significant part because of the United Nations. The Nuclear non proliferation Treaty, like the NPT, is another key success story for the UN system and has played a crucial role in limiting the spread of nuclear weapons over the past 50 years. President John F. Kennedy feared in the early 1960s that 25 states might possess nuclear weapons by the mid-1970s. While the number of states possessing nuclear weapons has grown, this nightmarish scenario has been avoided in large part due to the NPT and the multilateral framework uh, it has provided for preventing nuclear proliferation. Nevertheless, it is uh, particularly worrying that the five permanent member states of the Security Council have mostly failed in recent years to fulfill their obligations to seriously pursue nuclear disarmament, which risks undermining the precious non-proliferation gains achieved through the treaty. On the negative side, we must recognize that the UN has not always lived up to its uh, aspirations in promoting global peace and security. The failures of the UN in relation to a genocide in Rwanda 1994, Srebrenica 1995, and more recently Syria and Yemen, 
underline the high stakes involved in the UN's efforts to prevent and contain a violent conflict. I myself visited Rwanda and Srebrenica, and I could not help myself from bursting into tears when I was talking to the family members, and particularly mothers and wives of those people who have been murdered in Srebrenica. Now, looking back to what the United Nations has been doing, I think a divisions among the UN Security Council, in particular P5, Permanent 5, have often made this task more difficult and prevent, prevented the UN from taking effective action, timely action, sometimes with tragic and horrifying consequences. Last but not least, as a former Secretary General of the UN, I'm deeply concerned by the current global political division where multilateralism is in serious disarray. Right, so some initial thoughts there from Ban Ki-moon. I now want to move to Aya Chebi because um, Aya, at the launch of your new campaign, you silencing the guns, you said that the youth have, quote, the democratic power, the innovation power, the voting power, and the mobilization power. Um, and of course, the, the power to, to delegitimize violence and legitimize peace. But how can, can we, the, the older generations, make sure that we're truly listening and responding to the, the aspirations of young people? Find global leaders on this important platform. Uh, indeed, Mariam, since I've been assigned the, you know, the African Union Youth Envoy, I've been calling and advocating for intergenerational co-leadership which means not, not really mean that we're asking others to pass the torch or the baton to us, but to pass the truth, because we cannot inherit systems we do who desire. Otherwise, we are set to failure. Um, we need to compete with you now. We need to deeply understand the issues and learn from your mistakes so we don't fail next generation and we don't become products of failing global systems and continue to perpetuate them. Um, you know that young people, you know, and you're a journalist and you're in word news, so you know young people usually take the streets when no one listens because our struggle is a struggle for voice. And we've seen that the past decade all across the world. But the question is how many more revolutions we need to do for the millennials to be listened to? Um, and, and you need not only to listen, but to act on youth demands and innovation, even if you consider that a risk, you need to take that risk. Let's, let's look at how many governments since COVID-19 outbreak have recognized and certified youth innovation responding to the pandemic. How many young people are even part of global governance reform and response? Um, and I also always have to brief, you know, different stakeholders on COVID-19 impacts on millions of young people who lost their jobs and livelihood. And it's frustrating. I don't see action. I don't see seriousness about the generation gap crisis about the global leadership crisis. No one is telling my generation, where are the resources? Because we know we have enough for all of us to live with dignity. And why is it not empowering the most vulnerable? So I think we said it so many times the past decade to global leaders, nothing without us for us. And I hope this year would be the last year to say it because it's a special year, it's the UN 75. And we cannot move from here business as usual. We cannot build the future without the future, co-leading with you, and that future is now. Uh, that's that's uh, really good. Thank you so much, Aya, for those thoughts. And I want to pick up on, on what some of what you've said there with Professor Mohamed Bande. And of course, uh, Professor Bande, the, this UN 75 milestone is coming at a time of unprecedented global crisis after the, the COVID-19 pandemic. It, it's, it's a health emergency. It's a, it's a national security risk. But as Aya was, was pointing out just there, this is going to have far-reaching social and economic consequences, uh, particularly for the youth. They're going to be uh, perhaps disproportionately affected by, by the crisis that follows. Why does the role of the United Nations matter in all of this? Well, thank you very much indeed. I think uh, Aya is good to see you uh, doing great work for the continent of Africa. I think youth are critical 
as far the United Nations is concerned because of the energy and the creativity they bring to the table. Look at the issue of social justice that is currently unfolding. Look at the issue of, the issue of climate. The youth have shown commitment and leadership. And I like the idea of co-leadership, which is being discussed as a pathway. And the idea of inter intergenerational dialogue as represented partly in this forum is key. Because it's not just enough that you are youth. Experience is needed, knowledge is needed, and these are to be acquired. But you cannot have solutions to global problems without the majority, which are really in many countries, especially in Africa, the youth is the dominant uh, uh, group in terms of numbers. So this is key. The United Nations has understood this. And what it is doing is to not create only a youth envoy, but to mainstream the issue of youth and inclusion in all it does. This is the way to go. And I think because of the way the United Nations has made this critical, I think the United Nations has shown leadership. It also has people on the ground to understand trends and to profit from those trends and bring, but bring that to the conversation. This is important. And the United Nations has understood dealing with the future is dealing with the aspirations of those who will take over, but taking over requires a partnership that is a seamless partnership. This is what we want to mainstream. This is extremely critical. Professor Bande, can I get your thoughts on something else, uh, which is uh, that, you know, we have a, a medical emergency unfolding right now, but we also have a, an, another crisis, uh, or we're going to have a crisis that's going to get worse connected to, to unemployment, to perhaps entire industries and sectors and means of production possibly disappearing as a result of this. How do you begin to manage uh, the a crisis of this nature in such a, a hostile political climate? Because the global response so far has been very disjointed. World leaders can't even come up with a, a clear coordinated statement on the mat matter, uh, despite the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. You must be, you must be very worried about this. Well, I, I think two things, uh, not exactly uh, is, is, is a point of a glass half full. I think we, we, we recognize that we have gotten at the United Nations um, declarations or resolutions that have received wide support across the globe. This is where to start in terms of a normative framework. The other framework is the notion is indeed a commitment to leave no one behind. It may be fraying on occasion, but it's still strong enough to carry us through. Now, I agree with you, the response could have been uh, stronger, but it's coming because multilateral bodies, not only the UN and multilateral financial institutions have worked with the UN to create funding mechanisms and to make statements concerning our response. Now you have raised an important question of employment post COVID. I think this is a big question relating to change in the way we work, change in the way reward systems are in such a way that no one is simply left to fend for themselves, especially the most vulnerable. Now, it's a big question relating to how we provide education, how we provide training on the job and how we do partnerships. The United Nations is still leading on this matter with all of major financial institutions that are consequential. And it has people on the ground in each country to monitor. Can I just report. ask you, Professor, can I just, um, can I just quickly, because uh, I, I really want to get to Grow Hall and Brentland, but just very briefly, can you, are you hearing from, from Aya there about, about the youth and the youth particularly in Africa? And, and so, so much has happened in, in recent years uh, around protests and, uprisings and and you know you already had economic problems in the region is i mean is there anything being done to help the youth particularly when it comes to you, know, you talk about unemployment and education I mean, these things are, are going to get worse as a result of the pandemic what's being done to help them i, I think first of all the au is doing a tremendous job of coordinating responses not only the au regional organizations and when you take a look at 
30 years to now, we, we have been improving. First of all, conflicts are being addressed as African problems. The whole idea of the AU not accepting unconstitutional changes of government. This, this ones are big things that get us better than we have been before. The particular issue now is these financial mechanisms and the commitment to Addis Ababa. I think this one has to be pushed by the continent. And this is also what we are also pushing to recommit to what we have, we have said we would do, not only for Africa, but for the developing countries as well. Uh, this is important. And I think the situation is not as dire because there is better co collaboration within the continent itself. And the partnership of the, of the AU and the, and the UN is really even stronger. And this, I, I am certain, will carry us through the pandemic and beyond. Well, of course, COVID-19 has, has been described as the, the biggest challenge to face the United Nations since it's uh, its founding three quarters of a century ago. And this is a great place to get the thoughts of uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, former Director General of the World Health Organization. Uh, if I can ask you, Dr. Brundtland, how the WHO and the broader UN system is coping with the crisis, uh, not just in terms of the uh, immediate problems with uh, with life-saving support, but also in, in helping countries prepare for what is going to be a very difficult and long recovery period. Yes, <laughs> we certainly are in a major global crisis. Preventing the emergence and the spread of infectious disease is the preeminent example of a global public good. It merits unprecedented international cooperation. In containing a pandemic, we are only as strong as the weakest link in our human chain. Nobody is safe until everyone is safe. Last year, we warned that the, the world was ill-prepared for such a pandemic. Actions we called for have still not been taken. Without such actions, the world remains seriously vulnerable. A global crisis demands a global response by international organizations and particularly the World Health Organization. However, the virus has struck at a time when the pre-existing crisis of multilateralism has made it significantly more difficult for leaders and institutions to respond effectively and save lives. It is now essential that countries support the WHO and provide it with the necessary funding to carry out this work. The WHO must be enabled to work on behalf of all humanity, acting solely on the best available scientific and medical evidence. It is deeply unhelpful for the WHO to become a forum for political point scoring by member states in the pursuit of narrow national interests. Now it's clear the virus will not be overcome unless all states work together. Pooling resources and expertise to strengthen health systems, develop and distribute an effective and affordable vaccine, protect health workers, and provide the necessary care to all. This must particularly include vulnerable groups. Priority must be given to efforts to support fragile and poorer states, which have weaker health systems and lack the capacity to provide social safety, safety nets to limit the immediate economic and humanitarian impact of this pandemic. And Do Dr. Brundtland, you described there a, a, a very uh, rational and effective plan for responding to the pandemic, but it just seems as though we're, we're, we couldn't be further from, from the scenario that, that you described. We were touching on the point with Professor Bande about the absence of global leadership in response to COVID-19. You know, we have seen already that the kind of WHO becoming something of a, a political football. I'm sure that's dismayed you. Are you concerned about the pandemic strengthening populism? Well, of, of course, uh, first of all, as I said, we have a crisis already in multilateralism and part of that is populism, as you mentioned. We have populist leaders in several parts of the world that are 
directly or indirectly undermining our multilateral system. Uh, a crisis like this uh, illustrates the dangers of not working together, not having the collaborative spirit that is the whole essence of our multilateral system. So it just adds to the complexity of the era that we are in. What do you envisage happening if we just continue as we are? Because we've seen in some ways this crisis really playing into the hands of, of the populace, you know, in uh, several different countries in the world where we are getting this, uh, that we're getting this us and them narrative. Uh, we are seeing the undermining of public health experts and institutions. We're seeing the distortion of facts or, or just uh, some world leaders coming up with complete falsehoods about the virus. Well, this is the situation we are in. And the only, uh, you know, real um, way to deal with this is to speak out. It is for other leaders across the world to take charge, show leadership, and explain to those who are doing these, you know, un, uh, unhelpful things that this is not acceptable. I don't think we see enough of that. These, some of these uh, populist leaders are powerful in big countries like the United States. And clearly there are others who are not happy uh, to have to speak out against it. This is the problem, isn't it, Dr. Brooklyn Brinton, is that those that are like-minded that are in favor of there being more global coordination, I mean, their voices are completely drowned out by the ability of the, of the populace to, uh, well, it would seem kind of successfully tap into the, the frustrations that this crisis is going to unleash. Well, yeah, yes, you are right. And so th that's why, I mean, the only way uh, is to have people participate, engage together, inspire across nations, uh, people to uh, use their voices uh, and to speak out against this. Not only leaders that I mentioned, they are important, but people at large in different kinds of situations, in different groups, NGOs, activists, everyone, and business leaders, all of those who are involved in this forum need to take part in the public and global dialogue about how to change these situations. And by the way, you know, we have seen across the world that many people don't even participate in elections. Not only in the United States, where less than 50% go to the voting poll, but that happens in many countries. This is lack of participation in your own country and in the, you know, in the democracy of your own country. And actually, can I come to Aya Chebi on that point? Because if there were ever a time for uh, clear, fresh, innovative thinking, it's now. And obviously, you know, you advocate. Uh, intergenerational co-leadership, how can we get the youth to make more of a contribution and make sure that their voices are heard above uh, those politicians or, or those figures that might try to uh, manipulate them through this crisis in some way? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, very good question and I think it's back to governance. We need more young people in leadership. Uh, we launched a couple of weeks ago a report on greater inclusion of youth uh, in public service and governance and some of the recommendation we put forward to governments is to introduce and enforce youth quotas at every level of governance to address these disparities already existing and ensure it's mandatory for the leadership to include youth who may otherwise have to face many barriers to be part of those spaces. Second is to appoint young technocrats, special advisors, special envoys, uh, and young people in positions of leadership where they can support at every level of governance and drive innovation and transform the work, especially of executive arms in major ways. And third, and I think it's the most important, if we really want to transform the narrative now, you know, that is very individualistic and it's not going into multilateral collaboration, is to lower the age requirement 
for entry into government of young people, especially contesting for electoral positions. You know the gap between the minimum voting age and the minimum age of eligibility to run for office is unbelievable. <laughs> we have the average age of African leaders at 64, the average age of the population at 20. It's the largest gap in the world. And young people do not feel represented and they're not in informal politics. And that really distorts democratic ideals and privilege the participation of older citizens. And I think that disparity, uh, when, when we look at it from our generation perspective, we, we, we tell our elders, like many of you, the leaders of today were young when you entered office, uh, when you took leadership positions, you were radical, you were dynamic and you delivered. I mean, Thomas Sankara was 32 when he was president of Burkina Faso to 1987, the year I was born. So why can't we believe in youth to lead today the way it happened 30 and 60 years ago? I mean, Aya, tell me, I mean, this must be very frustrating for you, but I guess it's, uh, it's this is the problem with political power, isn't it? Because actually what we're, you know, we see that many of those freedom fighters and those revolutionaries from decades ago moved into leadership, but now we're seeing this trend in, in Africa and in other parts of the world where, you know, referendums and uh, political changes to extend constitutional term limits so um, so people can keep running and running. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is what makes young people angry and taken to the streets. And I, I don't think we should stop youth from being angry. We should channel their energy and absorb it into governance. So instead of seeing youth as this you know, dangerous class as this negative number of the unemployed, the refugee, the migrant. It, it, the, the picture of young people today in Africa and around the world is like the problem. We have to solve it, we have to fix it. But once we start seeing young people as the opportunity, as the ones who will change and reform, uh, the ones who will bring the values of collaboration and tolerance, because our generation actually is more inclined towards transnational solidarity, towards multitude of identities, uh, towards working together in, in multicultural spaces. We're more inclined into that. And I think the more we have young people into these spaces, we will change this narrative of, of populist you know, narrative and of you know, the migrant narrative as a crisis and the refugee narrative and, and the otherness. I think the more we bring youth voices into the space, that narrative will change and that will be reflected in our policies and our programs on the ground. Aya, how difficult is it though to get youth voices into the space of, of leadership? Because I know that you know, you've spoken about uh, about how difficult it is to be an activist when you're unemployed. You know, just saying with Professor Bande, this is something that's likely to get worse in the region uh, in the aftermath of, of the pandemic. We're already seeing it now. You know, it's hard when you're having to constantly hustle for work. You're trying to survive in, in a continent that is actually very wealthy, but you're struggling on a day-to-day -day basis for work. So, I mean, how do you galvanize and motivate uh, the youth to to keep going with their acti activism so they don't just sort of uh, fall away or, or disappear. Yeah, I think that goes back to your first question when you talked about youth power, because for me, when I started my activism, Pan-African activism, when I was part of Tunisia's revolution, and then, you know, it inspired young people in, in South Africa and Senegal and Gambia and Burkina Faso and other countries. And I think for me, the, that moment was an eye-opening moment that, you know, in, in the liberation movement, our leaders, they didn't have internet, they didn't have technology, they didn't have the platforms we have today, and yet they galvanized Pan-African solidarity and action across borders. Uh, and, and in 1960, 17 African countries got independence. So it didn't make sense to me, why are we the, the youngest generation in history 65% of our population is under 30. We have all the tools and yet we're not united. And I think that's our power, our demographic power to unite. We can vote anyone in and anyone out. If we decide to start a political party today, we can actually be the ones who are driving our countries, you know, in the leadership. But we are driving our countries in the economy because most of young people are the informal sector. So youth are making a change on the ground. They are the frontliners, but they are deliberately excluded from the leadership space. And yes, it is exhausting. And yes, 
we talk about mental health issues, we talk about youth surviving, you know, young people in Africa say we might not die of COVID-19, you know, we might die of hunger. Or it's, it's okay for me to die of COVID-19. I am anyway do not enjoy any human right in my country. I am already dying in the Mediterranean. So this narrative needs to change once young people realize their own power, their demographic power, their voting power, the technology that we have, the digital power. And all we need to do is to galvanize and mobilize together. And the movement is happening. That's not to say it's not, it's happening in Africa, it's happening globally, whether it's a climate movement, uh, whether it's the racial justice movement, whatever all these movements for the struggles are happening. But we need the leaders to listen and it's time, it's well, I, time for young people to go. Let me, let me then bring in, speaking about needing the leaders to listen, let's bring in Professor Bande because as I was saying, you know, Today, the average age of African leaders, 66 years old, the average age of the population, 20 years old. That's the largest generational gap in the world. In, you know, when you speak to leaders and decision makers, uh, are you trying, I mean, what are you doing for your part to make them understand that the youth are an opportunity for them? They shouldn't be excluded from the leadership space, as I was saying, and they shouldn't be seen as a, a threat or a problem. Yeah, I think let, let me say that I am fully in accord with most of what uh, I have stated. Uh, I just want to caution living in the US, simply in South Africa for the age of its leaders is not exactly completely fresh. I think uh, it's, it's a problem around the globe. Uh, I think let, let, let's clear that uh, on this matter, the gap has been there, but the age of African leaders is not larger than the age of leaders I have seen struggling for power in the United States either. I guess uh, it's in proportion. Yeah, yeah no, I know. So, so let me be clear about this. I think our point, the point to take is this issue of inclusion and the obstacles young people face. I think one of the obstacles is what she has stated and also has been stated by the WHO director. It is really the whole question of the exclusions relating to work spaces uh, have made it even more difficult uh, to take. I think what we have to do is really to continue to insist on what is right. And reference has been made by Ayat and also by some other speakers to the new technologies. I think these are important, important tools we can use to spread ideas. Those ideas were not broadly available to Africa years back. Even now, there's a major gap between Africa and the rest of the world around the technologies. And the issue of ideas, good and bad, are transmitted quickly through those technologies. I think one other element I would like to, to bring to the conversation is not just an issue of age. It has to do with knowledge. Let us privilege knowledge and empathy, both for the young and the old. It is this issue of absolute empathy and the nature of power itself that has brought the problematic that I is raising, that I'm also raising. Even revolutionary leaders give time when they continue to remain in power, assume this hubris that except for, if not for them, society will collapse and they seek to continue to perpetuate themselves. This is something that has to be fought very seriously in terms of getting legislation, in terms of activism. I think this is the point I want to make, that power has its particular problems. And the issue is now to say that even revolutionary leaders uh, get to a point where they become too conservative and try to really hold on to the notion that other, if not for them, everything will collapse. I think this is what we should fight collectively. And that's why I come back to the issue, this continuous idea of co-leadership, I think is what we should push. Co-leadership is important that all of us must come to this because if we don't have co-leadership, there is a complete break and we, we, we learn nothing. Let me... Um, you know, uh, can I come to Dr. Brundtland because we've spoken about the youth in Africa and we have seen this uh, uh, impressive mobilization of the youth in, in the West, well, all over the world, actually, but we've seen it particularly in Europe around 
climate change. Uh, Dr. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, how can that be harnessed and incorporated into some sort of plan for the future for, for tackling climate change? Well, you know, the, the, um, the world really uh, made important agreements in 2015 on the SDGs and on climate in Paris. Those were huge achievements for the world. They are an unprecedented effort towards strengthening human well being and creating a more prosperous and sustainable future. Now, the problem is there is progress to, as, to a certain extent, but I'm afraid we are not on course for achieving these goals by 2030. Now, we have in the late, latest couple of years seen young people raise up not only the Swedish girl, but across the world supporting her on protesting against uh, older leaders not dealing with the climate crisis as it should have been. It obviously has had an impression on many leaders. I think it has raised again the conscience of many that we must do more. And so youth has been speaking to leaders and I think they have had an impact. But of course the UN itself and the way that this forum talks about the future of UN will have a, a, an important uh, role in pursuing the SDGs and the climate crisis. But uh, Dr. Brunton, you must be, um, well, discouraged at the very least, you know, the Paris Climate Accord, the, the uh, really the, the emission pledges, the carbon emission pledges that were made under that accord never actually went far enough. And if anything, that agreement has been a, a casualty of the, uh, well, the rise of unilateral action with uh, various countries pulling out of the, of the agreement. I mean, most countries are not hitting their 2030 climate goals. And I suppose everyone is going to pay the price, but uh, particularly people in, uh, in developing countries. Yes, that has from the beginning uh, been an important aspect of the whole debate about SDGs and the climate issue, that it is hitting worst, the most vulnerable among us across the world, both in rich and poor countries. But of course, in poor countries, there are more uh, of, of um, the poverty and all of uh, the problems that are being um, in I mean, made worse by the crisis uh, on climate, and not only desertification, but leading to migration, you know, lack of clean water, all of it. It's, it's, a, it's a long chain of uh, very unfavorable events, which is why, in the end, the world was ready to come together on those goals in 2015. It took a long time, you know, because there was a big rift between the developed and the developing world for years. And I saw what happened when the SDGs were goals to be met by all countries. So the call for equality that is in the SDGs was also applicable to the rich countries. Before this, in the Millennium Development Goals, everything was only relevant for the developing world. So after that, I saw it was possible for the whole world to get together on both the SDGs and the 2015 uh, climate uh, agreement. That doesn't mean that everything is fixed because we need leadership and we need young people. We need everybody to be pursuing this. Otherwise, that kind of set goals will not uh, happen. Thank you, Dr. Brooklyn. And actually you've set us up very nicely uh, there for some reflections from uh, Ban Ki-moon on, on the, the Paris Climate Accord and, and its uh, effective implementation. The negative impacts of the climate crisis will become ever more visible and devastating in the coming decades. While there has been increasing rhetorical commitment by the world leaders, by many governments, to tackling climate change, the policy changes that would be necessary to turn these commitments into reality have largely 
not materialized. The Paris Climate Change Agreement was a significant achievement for the world. And despite its limitations, it provides an important framework for global efforts to tackle climate change. However, many governments are failing to fulfill even the modest uh, voluntary commitments they have made under the Paris Climate Agreement to reduce net carbon emissions. The economy recovery from COVID-19 uh, risks worsening the situation if countries do not publicly commit now to a resilient and climate conscious recovery and instead pursue short-term political and economic gains uh, through environmental degradation and continued investment in fossil fuel energy production. Industrialized countries pledged to mobilize $100 billion by 2020 and provide $100 billion per year thereafter, every year, for long-term climate change mitigation and adaptation for poor countries. This money is urgently needed by developing countries, yet the Green Climate Fund, GCF, has received far less than the promised amounts. As the current pandemic has shown, we need to build our society's resilience to emergencies of all kinds, because our current planning and preparation for viruses, for rising seas and other effects of climate change, are not sufficient to cope with the scale of the threats we face. Now, climate change is coming much, much faster than we may expect. Therefore, global leadership and sustained multilateral cooperation is a prerequisite for finding effective solutions to the climate crisis. It is therefore deeply concerning to see the rise of unilateralism and populist nationalism, especially in significant global powers, including some permanent members of the UN Security Council, the U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to leave the Paris Agreement was a deeply regrettable and unwillingness of the Trump administration to take action to address the climate crisis also emboldens others to renege on their commitment. I've been speaking out that President Trump's decision is a politically short-sighted, economically irresponsible, and immoral, and scientifically wrong. I sincerely hope that the United States will reconsider its current approach, regardless of the outcome of November's presidential election, and will choose to show global leadership once again in tackling this existential threat. Aya, if I can bring you in at this point, you know, the African continent is very vulnerable to climate change and will probably be hardest hit by these, uh, these changing weather patterns. Can I ask you if there are any types of, you know, the initiatives or what types of conversations the youth are having about this issue? How, how, how much do they care about climate change? How engaged are they with this? The post-war multilateral system Can you hear me? I ah, got you now. I wasn't sure if it was just me. Okay. Um, yeah, your question on, on climate change. I think I think it's 
I mean, the, the knowing and the obvious that Africa is hit the hardest by climate change yet contributes the least to the problem. Um, and the movement for climate change for African youth has been there for decades, actually, because we will see more migrants and, and refugees uh, of climate change more than you know conflicts and, and other root causes. Um, so I think the issue there with multiple issues with Africa is the narrative. The, 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 the African youth movement, whether it's the climate justice, whether it's gender equality, it's not the headline on the news. The headline on the news is African youth who are violent, you know, who are in, in violent extremism, who are dying in the Mediterranean. And I think what global community needs to do more, what you know, media also needs to do more is to recognize and amplify the African narrative. So all these climate activists can have also their voice heard at the international space, at the international community space. And I think it's really unfair, you know, for decades, young people and young activists have been fighting for this issue and yet they're not recognized, um, they're not appreciated. And at the end of the day, they're the ones who are impacted the most by it. And so they go to Paris, they go to all these, you know, big platforms, they, they even learn the language, you know, to, to put forward their recommendation. They do the endless consultations free of charge, and they're not paid for doing that. And at the end of the day, they're not recognized. So I think there is an issue there of an African narrative where Africa's narrative need to be upfront and need to be as equal as all different stakeholders and partners in the, in the international stage. Okay, so as promised, uh, Aya, thank you very much. Um, as promised, we now have a couple of questions from the audience. We're gonna, what, the way we're gonna do this is we'll hear the, the questions in quick succession. So one, two, three, four, then we'll get the response of our panelists. Let's hear the first question from Ms. Jimena Lieva Roche from the International Peace Institute in Guatemala. Oh, mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi there. Yeah, you can. Um, I can hear and see you very well. What's your question? Great. Thank you so much. So I have two questions. The first one to Professor Muhammad Bande. Um, you know, uh, sir, you were elected as president of the General Assembly on June 4th of 2019. And in your term as PGA, the world has completely changed. You also, Excellency, have worn many hats. You're a diplomat, but you're also a professor. So if, if we can step back and reflect on your year as PGA, what can you tell us of the state of global governance? And where do we go from here? Professor Professor Bande. Well, uh, yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, a difficult question, but uh, let me say that, that um, it's a forum here at the UN to learn every day. Uh, ambassadors are vibrant, knowledgeable, and do a difficult job of balancing their national interest with the interest of all of us. Uh, it's not easy, but there are seriously committed individuals representing countries trying to really solve problems. Uh, obviously, there are moments of frustration we all experience when especially major powers uh, tend to create even more difficulties. And this is not a good moment for that kind of thing to happen. And what we have to do is to continue to insist on international law, because there is no question, no country can go it alone. The pandemic at the World Health Organization former uh, Director General has stated, we agree, only bring this to real focus. We are connected with human beings and no country by itself can go it alone. Uh, I worry over mistakes that are taken seriously without a coherent approach. And I think this coherent approach that is principled, I think is needed even more so than had been the case before. 
in, in conclusion, I'm optimistic despite the difficulties. Thank you so much, Professor Bande. We now have the next question from Ms. Marie-Laure Croix, the global for the, who's with the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict in France. <laughs> Hello, uh, good morning and good afternoon. I'm actually GPAC, uh, the Global Partnership for the Prevention uh, of Armed Conflict is actually based in The Hague, so hello from The Hague. Oh, wonderful, hello from The Hague. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very sunny and warm, uh, very unusual. Uh, um, your question is for Dr. Brundtland. Absolutely, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to pose a question to Dr. Brundtland. Dr. Brundtland, uh, the United Nations used to play a role as policeman of the world that um, no longer really applies and is now searching for its uh, added value in the current uh, geopolitical situation. So Secretary General Gutierrez, for instance, is trying to position the UN as the key international actor to focus on conflict prevention, inclu including combating drivers and, and root causes of conflict. Uh, this year, uh, we have witnessed an imbalance in the global COVID response with a greater focus on healthcare and humanitarian aid, while there is a lack of attention and efforts and resources um, uh, for dealing with the long-term uh, destabilizing effects of COVID, particularly in terms of supports towards local civil society organizations or supports towards specific regions prone to social and economic unrest, such as is the case in, in Latin America, for instance. So in your capacity as co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board and, and former Director General of the World Health Organization, do you also notice this imbalance in the response to COVID-19? And what would be your advice toward the UN on how it should position itself in this field? Thank you so very much. Dr. Brundtland. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a large question. Um, we obviously, you know, th this is a health emergency, but preparedness in a, in a global health emergency affects everybody across the board from local communities, uh, every nation has spread like a pandemic like this one. It affects economy, the social situation, people get out of work. Uh, it, it really has dramatic broad consequences. The situation is that even though we have had SARS, MERS, H1N1, Ebola, and a number of panels to address what preparedness needs to be, what kind of preparedness the world needs to make. It just hasn't been followed up in the way that it should. Last year, we issued our report, our first report, warning about the risk of a major pandemic from uh, a pathogen that would be could be spread respiratory a virus uh, and of course um, in the pursuing a few months before it all started uh, the lack of preparedness that we had already described was the situation when the pandemic hit now we have as as our board tried to mobilize and with many, many others doing the same thing. Asking the G20 countries, asking the G7, talking directly with them about the much broader economic and social issues. The problem is that even though you and the IMF and the World Bank, all of them, but the conflicts inside a, a world of division have, have demonstrated that the G20 has not been able to come up with the kind of action that it should have and that it did back in 2008 when we had the big financial crisis. There is a lack of leadership today and a lack of ability between the major powers to work together to benefit all. Even on the vaccine question that I mentioned in an earlier intervention, we have not been able uh, to get support enough for an, a, a, a very fundamental initiative 
that vaccine has to be available at an affordable level for all countries and certainly for health personnel across the world. So nationalism in this sense is not acceptable, but so far we are working hard to get countries to sign up to this, but some major powers have not done so. So we are in a worse situation than I have ever seen in my long time as an environment minister, prime minister, director general, etc. That's the situation. Um, well, it's uh, it's not very encouraging, is it, Dr. Brundtland? But I think we definitely uh, appreciate your your honesty and uh, and your your candor on that. Um, and actually, the next question is for Miss Chebby, Aya Chebby, and this one is recorded. So it's a recorded question from Miss Tanula Makinde from the Savannah Center in Abuja. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Tinola Makinde. I work as a program assistant in Savannah Center for Diplomacy, Democracy and Development, FCT, Abuja, Nigeria. My question is posed to Miss Chebby. What quantifiable measures have been put in place to equip young Africans with the tools, skills, and opportunities to compete with their counterparts in the developed world, moving the continent from the third to the first world? Thank you. There has been a lot of measures put in place from continental level. We have the African Youth Charter and the Continental Education Strategy for Africa. At national level, we have national youth policies. We have multiple TIVET programs put in place. But I think two things need to be done. One is we need to enable young people to shape and support ideas that they come up with. And we need to allow for youth innovation and stop recreating solutions of the past to serve the future. We need to allow a futuristic thinking because that will eventually be the future of work. Um, and that will also open doors for young Africans to innovate on the continent and not go elsewhere. The second thing is we have a tremendous opportunity of everything digital to disrupt and get out of poverty and the current unemployment tragedy on the continent. The issue is not only skills, but access. We even if we have skilled, innovative youth, 70% of the population is offline. More than two thirds of Africa does not have electricity. With no energy, there is no digitalization across all sectors. So then access to knowledge and skills without access to opportunity becomes just access to frustrations. We need African government to invest now and in the next decade on digital transformation. Invest in infrastructure, invest in youth innovation, invest in skills and let youth do their magic. And if I may, Mariam, I just want to yeah. touch base on, on the peace security raised by Mari, because I don't think we addressed uh, peace and security a lot this morning. Um, I think the Security Council of the United Nations needs to answer to African youth who is selling arms to them to be trapped in conflict and poverty. There is a non-nuanced narrative of young Africans picking the guns. They need to be de-radicalized, but it's not Africans who are producing the guns. There are three resolutions on youth adopted at the Security Council. And yet the question remains, why guns are not silenced? If in a pandemic settings where we have social distancing, when we have lockdowns and all these measures and guns were not signed, then when? And if, and my question also, is the entity responsible for upholding global peace? Is it ensuring African agency? Since 80% of conflicts discussed at the Security Council are Africa or in Africa, yet we don't hold a seat at the P5. So I think also we need a conversation about how is the United Nations Security Council is being democratized and reformed in this global governance you know, conversation. 
a really important uh, question and issue that you raised there. So thank you for that, Aya. Just want to get to uh, the final question, actually. Uh, and that is from Professor Joris Larik. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, from the Leiden University in the Netherlands. Thanks very much. And yeah, that's perfect uh, uh, pronunciation. Um, my question is for, yeah, for Dr. Brundtland. I think what I take away from today's opening discussion is that there's a lot of frustration uh, in, in the sense that you need enormous energy and, and, and resources to get anything done, to get anything going. Uh, but it can be done. And it, it made me think of your, uh, your 1987 report, Our Common Future, which then actually led to a, a two and a half year intergovernmental process uh, culminating in the, uh, in the Rio Earth Summit. Um, can we do something like that again is essentially my question. Uh, is it not now the moment at UN75 to take this as an opportunity to kick off a process that will lead to, to real change? But yeah, seeing today's presentations, uh, do we have any fighting chance of that in this particularly challenging uh, environment? You know, interestingly, um, the uh, the last question uh, posed to me from The Hague, where I gave uh, quite a frank uh, assessment of where we are today, I think illustrates that although the situation is quite pessimistic, given the lack of attention to the global needs of the present situation among so many of our leaders. Uh, that means, given that we are in this situation, that we need to have enthusiastic and broad-based support and activism from many quarters, everywhere it is possible to try to get out of the logjam of the present difficult year or even era, because we need to move forward. And of course, this is what the Secretary General uh, is hoping for. We're also using this forum and other events to try to inspire uh, more common uh, inspiration and more common action. And th this means when we have a leadership situation at the moment, which is not performing very effectively globally, then we are even more dependent on people, on everybody. We are in this together and everyone has a voice. Everyone can do something. And this is why, you know, in this difficult situation, it is even more important that everyone from youth to all the different kinds of activists out there are trying uh, to get attention and to inspire action. And that has happened at the local, at the government, uh, yeah, at the national level, and of course, uh, at the international level, global level. We have a UN uh, uh, General Assembly starting next week. Hopefully, some of the pressure coming from quarters like this one, this forum and others, will inspire leaders at, you know, in, at that rostrum uh, to somehow speak truth to power and to somehow explain how we are going to get out of the present crisis and preventing future ones, not only in the health area, but much more generally to, pol to follow a sustainable development pattern going forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunt. And I think you, um, your message at the end there really cuts to the heart of this uh, forum and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, certainly it's about uh, accountability, speaking truth to power and individual responsibility. As you say, everyone can make a difference. Thank you very much um, to our panelists. Uh, really uh, appreciate your, uh, your contribution with this opening plenary. Uh, a couple of talking points to get through very quickly. Uh, now, uh, with the agenda, there's going to be four concurrent sessions from the program. There are different Zoom links for this. They were shared in the email that you received from the organizers on Monday, again earlier today. So different Zoom links for each session. Those sessions are as follows. Uh, the post-COVID recovery, the future of global economic and social governance. There's another session on rethinking the world system of collective security 75 years after San Francisco. The third session, reimagining the global human rights and humanitarian architecture. And finally, a fourth session on climate governance, the Paris Agreement and beyond. So you've got different Zoom links for each of those sessions. Uh, now, the other thing to tell you is that those four sessions will be uh, followed 
uh, starting at 12 noon New York time by three other thematic concurrent sessions. Uh, they will be on the following topics, a global civic ethic, countering rising nationalism and the future of global governance. The second session on the future of philanthropy in global governance. The third on technology financing and the future of global governance partnerships post COVID. Um, so that pretty much wraps up the, uh, the opening plenary for now. Um, I will see you tomorrow, uh, but I'll be tuning into some of those sessions today. So looking forward to that. Uh, I now want to introduce Rocky Dawuni, a Ghanaian singer, songwriter, and record producer who will perform his signature Afro root sound, which is a mixture of reggae, Afrobeat, high life, and song music. Over to Rocky. My name is Rocky Dawuni, and it is a great honor to perform for the UN 75 Global Governance Forum. We live in a time that is challenging every aspect and i feel this is a time to that we need unity around the world and this is a time to that we need the healing power of music to bring us all inside hope and also the power to overcome the song that i'm going to play right now is a song called shine a light and it's about all of us you know picking our lights and shining across the world together <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 